At around 2 a.m. on Sunday, January 12, 2020, Officer Aaron Stroncheck of the Geneva Police Department came across a body on an isolated bridge over a creek in rural Jay County, Indiana. The man appeared to be laboring with his breathing and was going in and out of consciousness. He had cuts, bruises, and a small amount of blood around his head. It appeared he had been shot. When paramedics arrived, they rushed him to hospital. Meanwhile, investigators cordoned off the scene and began to look for clues and any evidence. A search of the creek yielded the cell phone of the man who had just been flown to get treatment, and who would later die en route. When investigators searched the phone, they identified a phone call that he had at 12.02 a.m. that night. What they would come to learn was a wild tale of deceit, betrayal, and a crime with poor planning and seemingly no forethought or understanding of its consequences. This is the story of Shea Breyer. Portland, Indiana is a small city nestled in Jay County in the northeast of the state with a population of around 6,000 people. It's a little artsy community with the amenities you'd find in a cute little suburb, like a water park, a general store, an arts facility, a winery, a bookstore, a pet refuge, a fairgrounds, and of course, one of these. As of 2021, it had a median household income of 43200 below the state median of 62,700. It is here that today's story takes us. Shay Michael Breyer was born to Tracy Shelfont Breyer on March 9, 1988, in Ball Memorial Hospital in Muncie, Indiana, about 50 miles or 80 kilometers northeast of the capital city, Indianapolis. Shay's father was Robert Havel, and he had a sister named Sidney Havel. Shay and his mom moved to DeSoto, also in Indiana, for a period where Shea would begin kindergarten at DeSoto Elementary School. They moved again to Kailua, Hawaii, where he would continue elementary school. He then attended and graduated with honors from the Academy of the Pacific in 2006 in Honolulu, which closed in 2013. He was co-president of his senior class and played basketball, baseball, and bowling. A devout Christian, Shea was active in the churches wherever he went, including attending weekly Bible study and doing outreach activities with his church in Indiana. Shea would soon after join the Navy out of high school. He graduated from the Great Lakes Naval Station in Chicago in 2008. Then he went into training at San Antonio with the Navy Military Police, and he was stationed at Bangor Base in Washington as a Masters of Arms before transferring to the K-9 Handling Division when he was deployed to Italy. In 2012, he left that life and returned to a rural farm in Indiana where he became a heavy equipment operator at the Jay County Landfill and assisted on his family's farm. Around 1.30 a.m. on January 12, 2020, a motorist came across a body on a bridge on County Road 125 West in Jay County, a quiet rural stretch of gravel road. The frantic bystander dialed 911 and told dispatchers that the unidentified man looked like he'd been shot. When Officer Strongcheck responded to the scene at 1.58 a.m., he saw the man lying on his back in the roadway and immediately called it in. He was fading in and out of consciousness. He had abrasions and minor bleeding on his arms and hands and some blood around his head. Paramedics arrived and rushed him to the Adams Memorial Hospital in Decatur. Despite being unresponsive, he still had shallow vital signs. He was later rushed to Lutheran Hospital in Fort Wayne, but died en route. The body was taken for an autopsy where it was revealed he died of a 22 caliber bullet that entered the middle of his back, where it then went through his left atrium, left ventricle, and the septum of his heart. He bled out. The medical examiner theorized that when he was shot, he would have lost blood pressure almost immediately, 
which would have resulted in him falling and causing the bruises, scrapes, and minor bleeding noted at the scene. The man was Shea Breyer. Detective Mitch Sutton of the Jay County Sheriff's Department had the unenviable job of notifying Shea's family and close acquaintances of his death. Esther Stephen, one of those close acquaintances, said she last had contact with Shea on January 6 and, fighting through emotions, said she didn't know of anyone who wished Shea harm. Police cordoned off the area to search for clues. This was a really remote and isolated part of the state, so evidence could be hidden anywhere, if there at all. What they sought was any of Shay's belongings. After searching the surrounding areas and coming up with nothing, they had a team check the Loblolly Creek under the bridge. They retrieved Shay's phone and took it back to the station. After doing a search of it, they discovered a phone call made that night that would blow the case wide open. Oh my god, I'm pregnant! said a jubilant 27-year-old Esther Stephen. It was the spring of 2018 when she received the surprise news from a pregnancy test. Esther, who was not engaged or married at the time, was ecstatic. She told her family and friends, chief among them her favorite person, 17-year-old Shelby Highstand, and another teen, 17-year-old Hannah Napke. Esther was born around 1991 to Beth Stephen, she had a brother named Randy. She graduated from Jay County High School in Indiana in 2009. She was a classic tomboy. She apparently was good at handling hogs, and she had the plaques to prove it. She also loved softball and was the head coach of the Fort Recovery High School softball team since 2018. Shelby was a sportsman herself. She also attended Jay County High School. She was just an average kid who liked John Cena and Pop Rock, according to her Facebook page. Shelby and Esther did most things together. It helped that Shelby was the assistant head coach of the Fort Recovery High School softball team, as they are often pictured near each other in team photos. Esther and Shelby also worked together at a local daycare. Hannah herself was, surprise, a softball and star volleyball player at Fort Recovery High School. Hannah was apparently so good, she had her own college recruiting page on the website of the Next College Student Athlete Organization. In May 2019, she signed a letter of intent to play the sport at the Marshalltown Community College in Iowa. She graduated from high school that year and was off to Marshalltown. Things were looking up for Hannah. The girls congregated and asked who the father was, Esther. Darting her eyes silently at her friends, blurted out, Shay Briar, with a smirk. The surprising nature of the pregnancy would become evident soon after. Esther and Shay got together and had a discussion about the situation. Both were excited. Shay was a family man and badly wanted to have a family. He always wanted a child. On January 6, 2019, Adeline was born. Because the two sought a traditional family household, they decided to get engaged and start their lives together. Nearly one year later, during the week of January 5, 2020, Esther and Shelby are taking a drive along a rural stretch of road in Jay County called County Road 125 West. The two are excited as they point at different locales along the gravel road. They are making big plans to help Esther out. Esther has been feeling sad and upset the past couple of months. These two are the kinds of friends that are just about inseparable. It appeared they would rather not live than to live apart. Shelby will do anything to help a friend like Esther out, and vice versa. This week, Esther needs a huge favor of Shelby. The favor will test the strength of this relationship. A couple of days later, on January 8, Esther calls Christy Sibre, a woman who was a bit of a matriarch to the young ones. Christy was like the emotional towel for these kids. She received their thoughts, their venting sessions, and was probably a bit of a moderator. Hi Christy, it's Esther. Can I ask a huge favor of you? Um, so this Saturday night, Shelby and I will be working at a concession stand for a couple of hours, and I was kind of hoping you could look after Adeline. 
Yeah, sure, yeah, absolutely, bring her over. A couple of days later, at 10 p.m. on Saturday, January 11, 2020, Esther turned into Christie's driveway in Portland. She put the car in park, pulled the handbrake, and turned to Shelby in the front passenger seat and said she'd be right back. Esther got out, opened the backseat car door, and pulled out her one-year-old daughter, Adeline. She walked up to the front porch and rang the doorbell. Christy opened the door. The two hugged. Esther said she would be back in two hours and that she would call Christy when she was headed over to pick up Adeline. Esther got back into Shelby's car and drove to the concession stand. Then, they went to the daycare the two worked at. They waited outside. Then Hannah pulled up in her van to the daycare. Esther and Christy got in. So y'all ready? Esther said excitedly. Hannah was gripping the steering wheel tighter, her knuckles becoming white. Shelby's hands were visibly shaking, but she mustered the strength to nod. Esther then picked up the phone. Hello? Hey Shay, it's Esther. Esther was pacing, slowly running her hands through her brunette hair. She had come to visit Christy and she needed to vent. It was the fall of 2019. By now, Esther had visited Christy nearly a dozen times over the past three months. Christy knew Esther because her kids went to Esther's daycare and through Esther's work as a softball umpire. I, I, can't, I can't keep doing this, Esther said, turning red her neck veins clearly visible. That fall, mere months after getting engaged, Esther and Shay called off the engagement after one too many fights. After the breakup, the two had constant fights over custody and parenting time over Adeline. Esther complained that Shay was not there during her pregnancy, nor for the birth of Adeline. But it wasn't those things that really set her off today. Sometime in November, an upset Shay picked up the phone and dialed a number for an Indiana attorney. When the attorney picked up, Shay said he wanted to establish the paternity of Adeline. Shay wanted to make sure that Adeline was actually his kid. When the attorney asked him to tell him more, Shay told him that his ex fiance 29-year-old Esther Stephen, was keeping her away from him. She wouldn't let him visit her. Shay said the two had several fights that led them to go their separate ways that October, and the breakup was anything but amicable. Shay wanted the attorney to also file petitions to establish child support, wanted Adeline's last name changed to Briar, and ultimately just wanted more time with her. Shay's attorney filed the relevant documents on November 13. Then on December 11, Delaware County Circuit Court Judge Kimberly Dowling set a hearing date for February 5, 2020. He, he, d he doesn't deserve time with her. I, I, I don't want to share Adeline with him, Esther said. He needs to go. He needs to die. Esther was known to go on these types of rants. In the room was Shelby. Esther told Christy that she and Shelby had looked into ways of killing Shay, including crushing up pills and putting it in his drink beating him with a hammer, and getting a hitman to do the job. Esther even had an exact price for a hitman. During Esther's rant, Shelby nodded her head in agreement with whatever Esther was saying. At one point, Esther raised the possibility that one of the ways they could get rid of Shay was to shoot him. It was at this point that 17-year-old Shelby, who expressed her hatred of Shay for reasons that will be made clear later, finally piped up almost reflexively. Yeah, I could shoot him. At roughly 11.30 p.m. that Saturday night, January 11, 2020, Esther called Christy to tell her that she would be a little bit longer, but would be back to pick up her daughter soon. Earlier that night, before Esther dropped off Adeline, Esther drove Shelby's car to Shelby's house to pick up the teen's 22 caliber rifle. At 10.30 p.m. that Saturday night, Esther and Shelby drove to the Fairview United Methodist Church daycare center. Shelby took the rifle for a spin. She stepped out into the deserted parking lot and fired a test round to gauge how loud the gunshot would be. 
Then she hid the rifle in the trunk of Hannah Napke's van. Then they all hopped in. Yeah, sure, Shay told Esther on the phone. Okay, we'll come pick you up, Esther said. The three then drove to Shay's house at 315 West 7th Street in Portland. During the drive, the three women discussed the possibility of killing Shay on this night. At some point during the drive, Shelby took the wheel from Hannah and Esther moved from the front passenger seat to the back seat. The seating arrangement was part of the plot. When they arrived, Shay stepped out and Esther invited him in the back seat. She got flirty with Shay, who may have thought that the two would reconcile and possibly end the legal custody battle. Shelby began driving. She knew where to go because the drive that Esther and Shelby took earlier that week, the scene with them pointing in different directions, was to map out where best to kill Shay. They made it to that isolated strip of bridge on County Road 125 West. Shelby parked to the side. Esther asked Shay if he wanted to go for a walk and talk privately about their personal matters, under the guise that they would be out of earshot from Shelby and Hannah. He agreed. In actuality, Esther was luring Shay away from the van to give Shelby the opportunity to retrieve the rifle from the trunk without Shay noticing. As Esther and Shay walked across the bridge, Esther heard a loud bang and Shay immediately fell to the ground next to her. Hannah stood right next to Shelby when the shot was fired. Shelby was in a daze. She was sweating profusely despite the bitter cold of this Indiana winter, her entire body shaking. She said later that she blacked out when she took the shot. The girls began to panic. Shay was still alive. He was gasping for breath, reflexively turning his head back and forth trying to suck as much oxygen as he could. Of course, the girls didn't try to help him or call the police. The girls then left the scene only to think a short time later that Shay could use his phone to call for help. So they drove back. Hearing Shay straining for breath, Shelby reached into his pocket, pulled out his phone, and tossed it into the creek. She turned her back on him one last time, got into the car, and the girls drove off. Shay lay in the roadway and gasped for the cold air for more than two hours until a motorist came upon his body and alerted authorities. At 1 a.m., Christy heard tires making contact with her driveway and lights flash before her front door windows. Seconds later, she heard the doorbell. Esther, frazzled and seemingly out of breath, thanked Christy for doing her this favor. But Christy, who was never before asked to look after Adeline, was left wondering what Esther was up to tonight, so she asked. Esther said she couldn't tell her, but she would probably hear about it in a couple of days. After examining Shay's phone, investigators knew Esther was being dishonest when she told them that she last spoke with him on January 6, which is Adeline's birthday. In reality, the two last spoke on the phone at 12.02 a.m. on January 12th, basically the call asking him if he wanted to hang out. Two days after Shay died, on Tuesday, January 14, 2020, Detective Sutton and Ben Schwartz descended on the daycare where Esther and Shelby were working that day and brought them into the sheriff's office for questioning. After initially denying having been in contact with Shay on January 11 and 12, Esther admitted that she thought her life would be better without Shay. Joked and vented with friends about terminating him, and said she was at the scene when Shelby shot him. Shelby admitted to detectives that she detested Shay. According to testimony from Esther, Shelby was very jealous and very possessive of Esther, which would explain Shelby's unwavering support and attachment to Esther. When they got to the crime scene, Shelby said they were shooting at raccoons and that she accidentally shot Shay, claiming it was an accident but she eventually admitted that her and Esther had discussed ways to terminate Shay after he filed for paternity and custody and that she was the one who shot Shay. I grabbed my gun, standing on the opposite side of the bridge. I blacked out and pulled the trigger. Shelby told investigators that when she got home, she hid the rifle under her bed and the bullets in the drawer in her nightstand. Shelby, defeated, 
consented to a search of her phone, which revealed a text message she sent to Esther on December 5. Quote, Nope, I'm killing that bastard with my own two hands. On January 15, the state of Indiana charged Esther and Shelby with murder. Investigators in Marshalltown, Iowa, where Hannah Napke had just moved for college, arrested her on January 22 following an interview about the incident. Esther's jury trial was held between March 15 and March 18, 2021. A key person of interest to the state was Christy, who called police when she heard that Shay had died. She testified that she sat in and heard the kids plan to eliminate Shay. Christy said Esther was angry about the child's custody and visitation issues and that Esther told her that they had drugged Shay to see the effects of the medication on him. Testifying in her own defense, Esther said her and Shelby previously crushed 10 ibuprofen pills into Shay's iced tea in a chemistry experiment, but otherwise said she only vented about Shay and never plotted to actually eliminate him. She also said she never took Shelby's threats to terminate him seriously, that she never thought Shay would die that night, and that she was in shock and was confused when she lied to police about the last time she spoke with Shay. The jury didn't buy it, and found Esther guilty as charged. She buried her head in her elbow and cried upon hearing the verdict. For the sentencing phase, the jury had the following aggravating factors to weigh against any mitigating ones to determine how harsh the sentence would be. Esther's lack of remorse, her planning of the crime, her luring Shay to his demise, and the harm inflicted on the multiple victims, including Shay's family. On May 4, 2021, Esther Jane Stephen was sentenced to 55 years in prison. Her appeal was denied. Shelby's jury trial was held on August 9, 2021. The punctuating point for Shelby's fate was made when Jay County Prosecutor Wes Schemenauer argued her clear premeditated intent to see Shay gone when she threw his phone in the creek to make sure he couldn't call for help. She made dang sure she left him to die, Schemenauer said. She was found guilty as charged. The court heard impact statements before sentencing. Jackie Bryan, an acquaintance of Shelby's, gave testimony in favor of a lesser sentence, arguing that Shelby had been groomed by Esther for five years. Shelby's always been shy and socially awkward, Jackie said. When she had a friend, she always went out of her way to make them happy. Please remember when all this began, she was a child. She was a child that was manipulated and groomed. It's not an excuse, but it's a mitigating factor. Shelby apologized to Shay's family and said she hoped they could find it in themselves to forgive her. Shelby's defense team mounted its appeal for a lesser sentence on the grooming point. Our family has gone through hell since Shay was shot in the back and left to die in the road, said Shay's mother, Tracy Havel, as Shelby cried. Shay's aunt, Tiffany McLaughlin, said Shay is her first thought when I wake up and my last when I go to sleep, sometimes throughout the day. Shay's grandmother, Sharon Taylor, looked directly at Shelby and said, Shay is dead. You murdered him, Shelby. You watched Shay struggle to live. You murdered him. Sharon broke down and wept. J Circuit Court Judge Brian Hutchison, acknowledging that Shelby was and still is young, said there was no evidence of grooming. Until today, I have seen almost zero remorse from you, Brian said. The state is right. This is a cold-blooded kill. You had this planned, and I'm not sure, even though today I've seen your remorse, I am not sure you have any real comprehension on how deep your action is. Shelby Highstand was sentenced to 55 years in prison on October 20, 2021. Her appeal was denied. In September 2021, Hannah Napke pleaded guilty to voluntary manslaughter, further defined under the law as an intentional killing committed under sudden heat or passion. She received 10 years in prison with 7.5 years of probation. 22 months after Shay's murder, justice has been served. Shay's family said in a statement, Our family is so thankful for the Jay County Prosecutor's Office, the Jay County Sheriff Department, 
the Jay County Circuit Court, and the community. Nothing will bring Shay back, but we can now try and move forward by sharing his story and helping the community through the Shay Michael Breyer Memorial Fund. Adeline was put into the custody of Shay's grandmother, Sharon, of Red Key, Indiana. She will grow up not knowing her parents. There is a startling number of cases where a fight over a child ends up removing both parents from the picture, stunting the child's development. It's a theme that has one common underlier, selfishness. I've covered a couple of stories related to this, one being the Amy Heber case. While the Jared Bridegan case is still live, there is speculation that custody of the kids could be a motive in the crime. A mysterious aspect of the story is the notion of trust. It appeared Esther, Shelby, and Hannah had a bond so strong that it didn't occur to them that Christy would talk. In addition, what did Esther mean when she told Christy that she would find out in a couple of days where she was the Saturday night that Shay was killed? Was it going to come from herself? Was she expected to be arrested and for Christy to find out via news reports? Ultimately, it appeared Shay was just trying to do the right thing, provide a fatherly figure for his infant daughter and ensure that she had a balance of parenting in her development. Esther evidently didn't see it that way. She perhaps saw Shay as an uncommitted father and that it wasn't fair that he got to see her when she had to give birth to the baby alone. In any event, multiple lives have been destroyed by a crime that appeared done on a whim with no foresight, planning, or thought as to its consequences. It has left the lives of two teens, their families, the families of the victim, and of course, little Adeline, forever altered. Thank you so much for taking all of this time to listen to me narrate the story. As always, the story was based on secondary and primary sources, including court documents. Special thanks to the reporters who bring these stories to the public, and to you guys for engaging in the subject matter, and for suggesting improvements to the videos. If you got this far and enjoyed, thank you, and consider letting me know by using the comment box and clicking all of those buttons on the screen. In the meantime, please be safe, and of course, please, don't be Esther, Shelby, or Hannah. Bye.